Okay, <laughs> I think that Sarah, I think I'm live. So I'm gonna um, start. Hi, everyone who's come, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Jessie Lawson, I use they them pronouns. Um, I'm a radio producer and sound designer and kind of like youth worker sometimes. Um, and I get pretty nerdy about interviewing. <laughs> so I'm gonna run this kind of like masterclass on interviewing. Um, Yes. So um, this is what we're going to do today. Uh, there's like basically lots of different ways that you can use interviews and a couple of different ways that you can interview someone. So I just want to do a bunch of listening um, that shows kind of all of these different uh, ways that we can use interviews or like think about interviewing. So I'm going to just play a bunch of stuff um, and we can think about it. And then I've got some like tips and pointers at the end of like things that I've learned in my uh, interviewing life. Um, yeah, so I'll introduce everything as it comes. But yeah, there's like, we're going to start by thinking about how you can interview as a presenter. So as someone whose voice is also on the um, on the podcast or radio piece. Um, then we're going to think about audio montages, which is like a fancy phrase for when you cut out your voice, you cut out the voice of the interviewer and you just have the voice of the person you interviewed and it sounds like they're just talking to the listener. Um, then we're going to think about scripts, um, all our voiceovers and what they can do and how they can be fun. Then we're going to think about whether you can make a script out of an interview, which is just something that I'm thinking about at the moment and is quite fun. Um, and then I'll talk about, yeah, my top tips and then there'll be time at the end for questions as well. Um, if you have so I'm playing, I'm going to play a lot of audio. So if you have like thoughts or feelings or questions on specific pieces as they come up, um, you can write a question in and Sarah will send me that question or a question or a thought or whatever. So if you have a contribution that you want to make um, during the presentation, that's great. Let me know. Um, or like a burning question or whatever. Um, but there'll also be time at the end for questions. So you can like, there's no rush you can think and then ask at the end as well um cool um so yeah so we're gonna start oh sorry i've forgotten to change the powerpoint okay so um just uh so i'm gonna play a bunch of audio some of which i've made most of which i've not made just things that i like um but yeah so this these first kind of four pieces i'm gonna play are thinking about I guess in terms of presenters, so like if you have a piece of radio or audio um, where the presenter is featured as like a personality, as someone who is like asking the questions to the interviewee um, and they're like, yeah, they're like a person in a character in the documentary as well, or in the like, speech radio piece. Um, I think something that I would like everyone to get out of these four examples is that um, there isn't like a right way of being a presenter or a right way of asking questions as a presenter. Um, I think the only right thing to do is be naturally yourself and everyone has like a different version of their natural self. I think the only time where I get really put off when I'm listening to presenters asking questions is when I can tell that they're like trying to put on a different personality or like, um, yeah, when I can tell that they're not kind of being genuine, I guess. So that's, again, everything I say today, it's my taste and people could disagree. This isn't like, um, yeah, a comprehensive thing. This is just like, these are some thoughts that I have, which might be useful. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna play four examples of presenters that I have either worked with or that I've listened to who I think do a good job or do something which I like. And then I'll talk about it afterwards, um, why, I, you know, why I've picked the specific it. Um, so the first one is from a documentary that I made um, with my co-producer Ali Adlington and it's um, 
it's the first episode of Bent Documentaries, which is a series that we made a couple of years ago with young people from the London Borough of Brent. Um, so this is towards the beginning of, so the, the presenter's 15, he's called Khaled, he'd never presented before, but he's a stone cold legend. Um, and this is from the first interview in the documentary and his documentary is about, um, he basically loves drill music and was like, drill gets really bad name in the press. And so he wanted to make a documentary about like, why that is and why he likes drill basically um and so this is like the first little bit of his first interview in that documentary so i've decided to take a deeper look into drill and its background i'm trying to show what makes drill so popular and one of the most important music genres about it's a lot more than the politics around it so i'm starting with someone who's new on the drill scene but already making waves Milani, introduce yourself, please. Hi, so my name is Milani Money. Everyday grafting, never put half in. Well, you know about business plans, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm also like a drill artist as well. So it's very different, juggling a lot of stuff. But yeah, that's basically it. Love the way she corrected me. She said, I'm Milani Money. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur. I'm also a drill artist. <laughs> Well, I'm just Cali that I go to school. So yeah, that's, that's, that's just me and me. So Mulani's called at a rapping, but she's also been an entrepreneur since day. I've been doing hair since year eight. Oh. So yeah, I was a bit naughty. I used to like bunk lessons and stay in the oh. playground and make kids stay out. So I'd be doing the hair, like trying to get to this money. So I used to sit in the playground. <laughs> and do hair and not let the girls go i'll be like no just wait the teachers ain't gonna say nothing how do you start music probably when i hit year 10 year 9 year 10 mm -hmm. certain people i was rolling with they were actually doing music at the time mm. so i'm probably going to their studio sessions or their shows yes. and yeah. they'd get me to rap as well for like for bands mm -hmm. and then i'll probably spit a freestyle they'll gas me like oh my god you're actually yeah. hard for a girl it might be quite patronizing to hear, mm -hmm. you know, you're really good for a girl because yeah. you're actually really good, not yeah. just for a girl, just for an artist. Like yeah, you're better than a couple of the man them that do drill. Uh -huh. And yeah. so I, I was thinking, how how does it make you feel when when you hear for a girl? Do you know what? Um, before I actually dropped my first song, Self Made. So that's just a little clip from um, Khaled's documentary. It's called um, When Life Gives You Pain, Make Champagne. Um, yeah, so why I wanted to pick that clip, there are three things in that that I think are kind of like interesting in terms of thinking about your style as a, if you're working out your style as a presenter who does interviewing. I think the first thing is just like, obviously Khaled is um, just, he really puts interviewees at ease immediately. So like the first thing he did in that interview is he asked Milani to introduce herself and then made a joke about how he like is just Khaled and he just goes to school. And like that just, it just like sets the tone for like a nice, just a re like a relaxed conversation. And I think when contributors or interviewees are relaxed, you get the best stuff out of them. Um, so that's something that he just like naturally is really good at and I think is really great. Um, what are the other things that I think? Oh, and then the other thing that I think is like a good example of this, I'll talk about this in my like top tips later. Um, but, um, Khaled hadn't planned to ask a question about the fact that Milani, that people said, you know, Milani's pretty good for a girl. Um, that is that she just said that. And then he had, he like heard her say it and picked her up on it. And that's like something a balance that's really good to think about while you're interviewing is like, you have a plan and you have set questions, but really often really good bits come out of interviews when you actually listen to the person you're asking questions to and then ask them more about what they've just said. Um, so he he did a really good like intuitive bit of picking up on something that she said and then she says something like really great afterwards as well. So those are two things that I, I that, like two skills that Callan has, which I thought were really amazing um, as, a, as a presenter interviewer. Um, something else that I think about with this clip is um, he's really vocal. So even when Milani is talking, he'll be like, he like laughs or he'll be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like he is really, really vocal as an interviewer. Um, and some people really like that. Some interviewees find that encouraging. Um, and some people listening really like that. And some people find that really annoying because he's kind of not interrupting her, but he's kind of like 
is making sounds over her speech and some people find that distracting um so it's just a note to kind of to basically be like that's a total taste thing um and there's not necessarily a right or a wrong way of doing it there's definitely it's definitely good to think about are you interrupting too much or speaking over someone too much i personally really like Khaled style but some people don't so that's just something to be like what kind of presenter do i want to be do i want to do um interjecting or not kind of thing um so this next clip is from a new series on radio four that's the producer is called hannah dean and the presenter is called scotty um and it's looking at like i guess the kind of like fabricators behind artists work so it's kind of questioning like what is an artist um and who else is involved in like art making who isn't necessarily like credited or it's kind of looking i'm sure that they could explain it better than that but it's kind of about that a bit <laughs> um so this is just a little clip from the beginning towards the beginning of the first episode it's called taxi drivers um. and the thinker the co-curator of the tate exhibition nabila abdul nabi agreed Um, I've just got a note saying that you can't hear it. Can you, I'll just try it again. Oh, technology. Um, okay, I'm going to play it again. Just let me know if you can hear it. Pieces like The Kiss and The Thinker. Okay, cool. The co-curator of the Tate exhibition, Nabila Abdul Nabi, agreed to meet me in the gallery. I'll just show you this one too. This is a terracotta study for the thinker um, and this is really where Wadam would have been the most involved because he was so immensely talented at modeling figures in clay bringing out the expressiveness of the human figure but the terracotta model would then be cast in plaster and that of course is the closest index we have of that original model and then he would go on to produce the sculptures either in marble mm -hmm. or in bronze and that would require the assistance of a number of technicians you know it's so amazing to see now these images of him we always have a little a little uh, laugh when we see images of him holding a chisel you know by a marble sculpture of his or what have you because we know that he would not really have been involved in that process he employed um, a number of technicians to do that work with him. But this sort of um, posturing that he's doing, the brand, building up the brand, this is like really early, like, art, art genius's ego, like, lone genius, it's me, I do it alone. Exactly. So do, did he ever really acknowledge the other? I mean, in your research of, like, really uncovering who's behind the work, you know, is it up front and centre that there are other people interjecting here or you've had to find this in other ways? It's case by case. Right. It's really case by case. I mean, did he credit his assistants like Camille Claudel, let's say, the, the one of the number of assistants who worked in the studio? Not really. And that's, I mean, this is this was the nature of the day. That's something we have to always think is to place his practice within its um, social, historical context, but also to recognize that today um, we need to question some of the entrenched ideas about how artistic practice also um, develops. Um, why do we whisper in galleries? I don't know. It's a great question. <laughs> Should I not be whispering? I don't know. Okay, so I'm Danny Um. Yes, that's just a little bit from Taxi Drivers. Um, and yeah, I think again, there's like three-ish reasons why I picked that one. So the first one is just like, um, oh, just so nice to hear an interview, one not done over Zoom um, and two done like in situ in a real place. Obviously that's completely, a, you know, you can only do that safety permitting with COVID. Um, but I really, you know, obviously radio doesn't have any visuals and it's really, I really like having at least one interview in the documentaries that I make, which happens 
in a place where the it, where the presenter and the interviewee are doing something together because I think it it helps you build a picture in your mind you can like see them in the art gallery um and it's just like a bit of texture and like sonic difference if other interviews that you're doing are either in like you know sterile like quiet rooms if you've done them in person or like over zoom so it's just kind of like disembodied voices it's really nice to have a balance um of different like places where you do your interviews i think um and then what did i like about scotty i liked how scotty um talks about like building up a personal brand um so they're talking about an artist you know that made work a long time ago um and Scotty did a good job, I think, that this person that he's interviewing is probably used to talking about this artist all of the time, has probably done stuff for like the BBC before or for, um, I don't know, <laughs> fancy organisations is the only phrase that's coming to me. Um, so she probably has a certain way that she talks about this artist. Um, and Scotty does two things. The first thing that he does is he think he uses, he likens it to like building a personal brand which is like language that we would use today to talk about like influencers or you know people artists now um so he is encouraging the person he's interviewing not to use too technical language he's like setting a level of accessibility for people listening which i really like um and in a similar way i really like that he makes a joke at the end about whispering in galleries and you can really hear in his interviewee's response that it's a bit surprising and therefore she's like I don't know, like, not, it's not that she stops being professional, but she, she kind of relaxes a bit and like, it sounds like she's not saying things that she said before or that she's like rehearsed as much or something. And that those little kind of moments of connection between interviewer and interviewee, I think are really nice to hear as a listener. Um, so that's why I picked that one. Uh, I've just got two more examples of presenters that I like, and then, um, and then we're going to think about something else. So this um, next one is from a podcast series called About Race, which is presented by um, Rennie Edo Lodge. And I'm going to play it first and then talk about what I like after. The only thing to say is that this is an episode from, it's episode four in the series, which is called Political Blackness. So it's looking at this concept of political blackness and what like what she thinks about it, basically. Um, and this is an interview that she does with the MP, Diane Abbott. My stance back then appears to be the consensus now. Have you seen that backlash against no, the idea? No, there's been a huge backlash against the idea of political blackness. When we came in in, in 87... Shadow Home Secretary, Diane Abbott. MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington for over three decades... She was the first black woman in Britain to be elected to Parliament. We spoke in her Portcullis House office. There were... For the benefit of the tape, Diane's looking for something. What she found? You've got a picture here? Uh, this is a picture of... It's a picture of me and Bernie and Jeremy, actually, and Bernie Grant's wife. So we've got, we've got a very young-looking Diane here. We've got Bernie Grant. Was he, was he an MP at this point? Yeah. Um, yeah, so he was the MP for Tottenham, yeah. which is where I grew up. Then we've got a very young-looking Jeremy Corbyn with a very, very full beard. And a lady on the end who you say she was Bernie Grant's wife? Sharon Grant. Sharon, Sharon Grant. Grant. She was a councillor in Haringey. And Jeremy was a, a councillor in Haringey also. So, yeah, there's been a huge backlash against political blackness. So when we all got... Um, Elected in 87, Keith Vaz was actually from Goa. I think he's an Indian for, from Goa. Paul Boateng, his father was a Ghanaian politician. Um, yeah, so that's just like the beginning of that interview um, with Diane Abbott. Just the two things that I really like about um, what Rennie does there is she's obviously gone to Diane's house and Diane's like, squiggling around and like finding things and stuff and it's really nice to hear that audio in a similar way to Scotty going and interviewing someone in the art gallery I really like um the sounds of someone rustling around their own home uh but obviously it's very simple but we obviously can't see the photos that Diane's showing and Rennie does a really good job of literally saying for the benefit of the tape 
this is what's happening and then describing what's happening. Um, and then Diane lists a bunch of politicians by their first name and Rennie does a good job of being like, and who do you mean by that? Is that Jeremy Corbyn? Is that Bernie Brown, et cetera? Which is um, again, useful for people listening who don't know these things. And that's something to think about as a presenter is your, you're like the gateway between um, the listener and your interviewee. So if they say things that you don't understand or they, they say things that you are not sure that your listener would understand, like depending on who your audience is, um, it's your job as the interviewer to ask someone to clarify something or ask someone to explain the meaning of something or, or those kind of things. I think that Ray does that really well without um, interrupting the flow of the conversation. Um, and the other thing that she does, which is just really small, is when she's talking about Bernie Grant, she's like MP for Tottenham, which is where I grew up. And I think, again, if you're a kind of like personality, if you're, you know, the person presenting the podcast or the radio documentary, um, and there's a reason that you're doing it, it's really good and nice to relate um, the stuff that your interviewee is saying to your own life, because it, um, it like get, lets listeners be more, a bit more engaged in you and also like, uh, like get to know you a bit um yeah it just makes it relatable and makes your interview what they're saying relatable to and um, so that's things that I like about that one um and then lastly uh I guess um yeah so this last one is from a podcast that's called Another Round which is an American podcast hosted by two people called Heaven and Tracy um and yeah it's from an interview they did with Hillary Clinton which I just think is interesting because Hillary Clinton is like um in the way that I was talking about the person at the art gallery will have like practiced you know will have been asked about that artist multiple times Hillary Clinton is like so this was in 2015 so before she ran um for president but it's like she is a politician so she is trained media trained um and it's interesting seeing how these two presenters have planned their questions around the fact that she's media trained and will probably be speaking in like quotes if that makes sense um so i'm just getting it to the right minute okay to school or to ballet i had a really just kind of run-of-the-mill ordinary life and it wasn't until he became president that i really encountered that overwhelming sense of the bubble, the, the scrutiny. So I don't know that you ever get used to it, but you do sort of learn how to manage it so that you can get up every day and go about your life. Yeah, we talk a lot about self-care on our show, like just day-to-day -day things you Thank do to take you. care of yourself. <laughs> what, it's important. Like, what do you do for self-care? Right, when you mentioned activities, like yes. what <laughs> activities do you do? Uh, I really love yoga. I love long walks. I'll go on those any chance I get. My husband and I take our two dogs. We go walking around where we live in New York when we can. You know, just things that you feel like, oh my gosh, this is what it's meant to be. This is what I want to do. And uh, I try to fit that in as often as I can. There was a moment when you were on the campaign trail in 2008 famous moment one of my favorite moments that i've ever seen from a politician which i have like maybe two or three That's favorite fair. political moments <laughs> i'm not a political that person that i <laughs> ever maybe, said that maybe three but you were in new hampshire and someone asked you like how do you get up and go out the door every day and you got very very emotional i did i know that there's been a lot of talk about what led up to that moment but how did you feel afterwards like when you got home that night were you like oh i shouldn't have done that did you feel like you were showing a sign of weakness or did you feel powerful and like normal how did you feel when it was over? That's a great question. And I don't know that anybody has ever asked that of me before. I did not know that's how I was going to feel. At the time I was doing an event and I was sitting in a, like a cafe, a little restaurant and people were asking me questions and they were asking me about political issues. Yeah, so I thought that was just like, um... A really good example of like a well-planned interview, I think, in that um, Heaven and Tracy are great presenters. In, again, it's a taste thing. They actually do like quite a lot of talking over each other. Some people don't like that so much. Um, but I really, I really, I think the my style of presenter, I really like um, listening to them. They make me feel like I'm their mate kind of thing. Um, 
and they've obviously done some really good planning in that they were like how are we going to make Hillary feel comfortable with us and trust us and like calm and happy in the space and they did that by like having charming personalities and then asking about self-care which is like a nice and friendly question and then they work up to this moment where they want to ask about this like specific thing that happened which is clearly quite a big deal and she's clearly spoken about publicly a lot already and they've clearly done research over that and thought like what is a question that we could ask her that she's not been asked before that she's not addressed before which would let her talk about this issue that we want to hear about this thing that happened that we want to hear about without her just hearing the question and then just immediately going to like the, the rehearsed line that politicians have and I think you can really hear in her answer she starts being like that's such a good question that she really starts like actually thinking about it and considering it and thinking about what she wants to say um and I just think that's like a pretty good achievement if you're interviewing someone as prepped for interviews Hillary Clinton so that's um I guess the main maybe takeaway from that is uh, it's really good to uh do your research <laughs> and know um a lot about the person that you're interviewing and think about what you want from them and how to get that if that makes sense um so that's my whistle stop tour through presenting styles that I think are nice um I'm happy to talk more about any of those at the end as well or now if people have questions um but for now I'm going to move on and play three examples of another way that you can use interviews which is doing the uh the audio montage which is basically like when you interview someone um as a radio producer um and with the intention of taking your voice out of the interview so you're interviewing someone um and asking them to put your question in their answer so if you say like where did you grow up you model to them if you could reply saying I grew up in London rather than London for example so it doesn't sound like you've asked them any questions you do that you do an interview I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about ways of doing that later but you do these interviews in a way that make it sound like someone is talking at the listener so like telling their own story to the listener um I do this quite a lot I find it really fun the reason I find it fun is because it um there's lots of opportunity for sound design um when you do interviews like this because it's just like one or two voices talking to the listener and you you then like pad it out with music and sounds that kind of like accentuate the story I guess um, so we're starting off with like just a very popular uh, podcast, American podcast called Love and Radio, who are the kind of like, um, they do this really well. Every episode is almost exclusively like this. Um, like um, It's almost exclusively audio montages. Um, and they, yeah, they are kind of famous for doing really long interviews. So they'll, they'll, they'll meet a contributor, or they'll make someone with a story to tell they'll do loads of interviews like off mic get to know their story really well and then go and see them you know multiple times and then do these really long interviews go over and over and over and over the story and then it lets them make these like really like, i think quite beautiful pieces um so i'm just going to play you the beginning of one of my favorite ones um which is called the living room <laughs> So I've been living in my apartment about 15 years. And one evening I walked in the living room, which has three bay windows, which face the gardens in the back. And over half a block of gardens and across a small street, there was this bright window that I'd never noticed before. But it's at the exact eye level of my third floor apartment. And after a while, I realized that I'd never seen it because there had always been curtains. And so it was always, I think, dimly lit. The curtains were often closed. And all of a sudden, there's this bright light and no curtains. And it was like a movie screen. Fifteen years, and that window has meant nothing. <laughs> I haven't even noticed it. And now it's all I think about.
there were new tenants and it had always been a living room and now it was suddenly a bedroom and there were these two people in there and they were naked this young couple in their 20s they were really lovey-dovey and they were always naked from radiotopia you're listening to love and radio yes that's just like the beginning of that that's that's like a 23 minute episode so lots of stuff unfolds in the story but um I, yeah i would recommend i mean i'd recommend everything that I've, i'm going to share today um but yes yeah, so it's just fun to think about how that has come out of an interview and what's really cool about doing interviews in this way is for people who haven't made radio before people who aren't presenters but who have stories to tell it's a way of like getting to tell their stories in their own voice like in the way that they would usually tell them without needing a script without writing it down it sounds really natural and it also sounds for me it's like part of the intimacy of radio listening to stories like this because it sounds like someone's talking directly to you and that's really like compelling for me um so it's fun to think about like what questions like when you're listening to these examples, what questions the producer might have asked to, to, to like facilitate these responses that she's giving. So like one of them could be just like, tell me about the first time you noticed the the window or the, the light in the window. And then she could tell that story. There's a bit where she's talking about how the couple are really lovey-dovey. So that might've been the producer saying something like, can you describe what the how the couple acted with each other? Do you know what I mean? So it, it's like, you have to think of questions like that to get someone to, not only tell the facts of a story, but to tell all the deep that you know the details and the descriptive bits that make you visualize it and feel it. So that's an example of yeah, just like into the whole episode is an interview with one person, and then the producer's voice has been taken out, and it's just this one person telling one story. So that's one thing you can do with like audio montages. Um, the next example is from a piece that I made. Um, this last year um which is part of the unfiltered history tour which i made with vice and the idea of the unfiltered history tour is we um it's like an interactive tour that you can do in the british museum if it's not affiliated with the british museum it's like interviewing people from the countries the objects in the british museum are stolen from um so you can do it in the museum, but there was, we also made a podcast series that came alongside it. So this is an, from an episode of the podcast series. Um, and it's about the shield, which is um, from what is known as, known as Australia. Um, and why I am playing this one is because it's two voices. So I, we did it all on Zoom. Um, and these two people were in two different places but so what i did is two interviews separately with them telling the kind of well asking similar questions in terms of about it was about the story of the google shield um but from their own perspectives and then what i did is like interweave their voices so that they're telling the story at the same time um so we can think about that Rodney Kelly, a Gweigal young man, and the Gweigal shield in the British Museum uh, was stolen from my people. My name is Claire G. Coleman. I'm an Aboriginal person of the Noongar people. I am not of the Gweigal people, but the theft of that shield was to me a symbolic act that says a lot about Australia. In 1770, Captain Cook arrived on his ship, you know, the Endeavour, sailed up the east coast of Australia and he found a special spot, it was called Kamei, and now it's called Botany Bay. He anchored his ship, you know, even before he come ashore, uh, there were two warriors. They were waving their spears around. He was trying to come ashore and the two warriors gave him that signal that he wasn't welcome. It's the first time that he came in contact with Aboriginal people and his own journal says that he shot at them and shot one of them. And Cook hadn't even got off the boat yet. 
So he wasn't even in danger. Yeah, that's a little section from the Unfiltered History tour. Um, I guess something that I was thinking about while I was listening to that um, is the benefit of having into two people instead of one person. I think it sounds nice and it's nice to get more than one perspective on history like that. Um, but it also meant that I was able to use the kind of like, they were, they had different bits of the story that they were stronger at telling or different facts that they knew more about or had like specific feelings about. And so what's quite useful with having two interviews like that is that it, it kind of takes the pressure off each of the interviewees because there's someone else who has a way of telling the story too. And then you can like weave them together with the best bits of each of their interview. Um, so that's, yeah, that's something to think about, I guess, if you're doing, if you're interested in like audio montage stuff. Um, and then this last one, I'm going to play thinking just about, yeah, about um, audio montages is from someone called The Mad Genius and it's called The Magic Skates. And I'm playing it, my friend played it to me the other day and I was just like, wow, this is amazing. And this is like, um, it's just like a, if people are interested in sound design and using interviews for sound design, it's just a fun one to know about. Um, so I'll play some of it and then we can think about it. and said, oh, I'm just going to roller skate on the dog path with, you know, with the dog. And my husband said, oh, roller derby's having a tryout. You should go check it out. And I <laughs> never went on roller skates. I learned to ice skate as an adult, and I was competitive, but Madison's very competitive for roller derby. My first derby practice was terrifying. Is this right? And painful. What? They cut 20 people on that first day. And there are eight spots. I got cut mid-season. There's only one tryout a year. By then, I was hooked. When I had my skates on, I'm graceful. And when I have my skates on, Yeah, so that's uh, that's about half of like that that piece is like for, for almost five minutes long, so it's just it's a shorter piece um, where they've obviously gone to like where some where a team practices roller derby and then like recorded the sounds and and part of the music that you're hearing is like the sounds that they've recorded, which is super fun and cool. Um, but in terms of thinking about the interview, it's just like a fun. It's just a really fun thing to practice and think about is like the melodies of someone's voice, like the rhythm that someone speaks and the words that they're saying. And, and if, if sometimes they are like rhymes or do you know what I mean? And then like you can quite easily when you're sound designing. So I do this when making documentaries as well. And I, if I've got like a bit of music running under an interview, sometimes if you're accentuating a certain bit or a certain phrase or a certain thing someone's saying you can like line someone's speech with the first beat of the bar or like you can do lots of different really fun things um or like one time we, one of the documentaries the, the event documentaries we made is like one about what you don't learn at school and one of them was about money and there was like quite a long and boring bit where someone was explaining like about 
how they got into some quite complicated debt and like the intricacies of it were important but also a little bit dull and so we just like remixed that section to like something that sounded like a song and so it was kind of it just lifted it and made it a bit more fun um and that is still like from effectively like what we, we just had to do was an interview with one person and then just some background sounds where they were um so it's fun to think about like yeah the experimentation that you can do still just with one person's voice um, so that's the kind of like, that's yeah, audio montages, try them, they're fun. And um, we'll think about tips for how to do the, the interviews of those audio montages later. Um, the next thing I wanted to do a little bit of thinking about was script, using script. So when you're making um, speech document, fa you know, factual documentaries, which is what I do um, mainly, um you will often have a presenter who is doing interviews with contributors and then as a producer you edit it all together and then you have a script over the top a voiceover from the presenter that um you know that ties it all together that tells the story of the documentary um and scripts are really useful in the same way that i was talking about um, with the unfiltered history tour, having two voices is useful because they can fill in the gaps that each other haven't necessarily filled in or haven't been as strong talking about. With scripts, when you are writing a script with a presenter, they can also fill in um, information. They can either fill in information that the interviewee hasn't or about the interviewee. So they can be like, this is Jesse Lawson. We're interviewing them about blah, blah. That can be written into the script. And also, um, if someone takes a really long time to talk about something, a really easy thing to do is just script the information over the top. So instead of having to listen to five minutes of someone explaining like what the hostile environment is, if they if they said it and it was amazing, but it was just like really long and you don't have time for that, you can write in the script a much more concise description of the hostile environment, fade out of the interviewee explaining it and have your presenter just explain it much quicker and then fade back into the interviewee to move the interview along. So yeah, script is really useful, I guess, for kind of things like pacing and adding in information where you need it. Um, so I've just got, yeah, three examples of ways that you can use script. So one of them is from the last series of event documentaries, which is the series that um, I made in 2020. Um, and this, I'll play it first and then talk about why I played it, but it's, um, the presenter is 16, she's called Nora, um, and she is making a documentary about how black boys are disproportionately excluded from school. Um, and so this is a section where she's talking to a contributor, an interviewee, who's done research on this. Um, and there, it's like a, where I'm dropping in is a section where they're talking about um, the racism that they experienced at school. So I'm just doing the technical bit. Cuba had this one teacher in primary school who she still thinks about. Did she do things like play uh, Sam Cooke's Chain Gang? Which is a song that's pretty much about, I guess, men in prison working in a chain gang and sort of breaking rocks and that sort of thing. She played it and when we were doing sort of working or do whatever children do <laughs> when the teacher's not directly telling them what to do and she'd sort of point to me and say like this is your song you love this song don't you and i remember thinking it was i knew it was strange but i just didn't know how to articulate that sort of at what nine years old <laughs> i've had experiences like this Quite often, I felt like me and my black friends are asked to stay behind after a lesson, even if the other kids were misbehaving too. There's been loads of times where I've kind of felt like teachers are treating me differently, even if they aren't being direct about it. I guess the, the feeling of not having complete trust in your teachers, it can... It means that you have, you're less likely to maybe engage with work, to take anything they're saying seriously. It's harder to to participate in, in, in classes generally when you know that the person who's running them doesn't respect you or doesn't think that you're worth listening to. And then when you consider all the other ways systematic racism affects black young people, we're more likely to experience poverty, 
we're disproportionately stopped and searched by the police and on and on. It's not surprising that we're sometimes less trusting of authority. And that could lead to talking maybe in class or I don't know, doing anything other than what you're being asked to do. And I feel like when I was in primary school, I was quite mouthy and would end up outside the head teacher's office all the time. That was usually in response to things that I thought were wrong. When you're a child and you feel like something an adult is doing is wrong, it's really difficult to call them out unless you have someone who's championing you and, and, and telling you you should challenge those things. Yeah, so that um, there are some there are like two things I wanted to point out in that example of like when scripting can be useful, I guess. So the first one is like what I said um, before, like the beginning of that clip is Nora saying there's a teacher at school that Kuba still thinks about, um, and that's because this story of the of Kuba's teacher playing um, chain gang to her. This came like halfway through an interview and we were like chatting about other stuff and then this kind of story came up and we started talking about Nora and Cooper started talking about it. And so there wasn't like a, a clean beginning of the story because Cooper was it was she was referencing other stuff and she was, you know, talking about stuff. So it was all a bit like muddled. So we couldn't find a place in the interview itself where Cooper said, I used to have a teacher at school that did this to me. And so that's when a script is really useful because then we just could write a little bit of script with Nora where she just says, there was this teacher and then we can drop it into Kuba telling the story. So that's ways in which scripts can just kind of like make up for things that you haven't got in the interview basically. Um, and then other bits is like a lot of the time I work with presenters who haven't done presenting before necessarily. Um, and if you are newer to presenting, um, it sometimes takes you like a little bit of time to think about what you think about the person, what the person is saying to you. So Cooper told this story and like after the interview had finished and when me and Nora were talking about it, Nora was like, oh yeah, like that used to happen to me too. But in the moment, Nora didn't, you know, she was, you know, she was concentrating on doing the interview, other stuff was happening. She didn't have the time, she didn't, you know, it didn't happen that she said to Cooper, this is something that I experienced too. And so, when you're making a documentary you have the time to then even in, even though Nora didn't get to share the story in the interview itself we could then write that story into the script and so it could still go into that section of the documentary if that makes sense um so that's where scripting can be useful as well um it just gives you like some breathing space basically if you're using a script um so yeah and that's like I just want to play an, the next example I'm playing is from Radio Lab, which is again like a really big American podcast, and they're famous for doing this that type of scripting in and out, having a, having scripts and then a clip from an interview and then a little bit of script and clip from an interview. They do that really in a really extreme way, like they chop in and out of script and interview loads. Um, I I find this clip a really useful example, but I will say that the um, Oh, hang on, I've lost it. Oh, no, I haven't. I've got it. Uh, the, un the thing that's unfortunate about this clip is that um, the presenter's voice is quite similar to the person's voice that she's interviewing. So I'm sorry if it's a little bit confusing who's who. Um, oh, uh, I'll just talk to this. So we've had a question saying, thanks for this, Jesse. How do you deal with interviewing people who've experienced personal tragedy? Um, I feel like I'm prying and I shouldn't be bringing up pain. I have a section later about working with contributors who have like specific experiences like that. So I, I'm just like saying that I've heard your question and I'm going to, we will come back to it later. Um, so yeah, so this one is just a way of thinking about like, it's just, they, I think that they're like, they have interesting ways of using scripts. So just try and listen and try and see if you can hear what bit is part of an interview and what bit's being scripted. Something to listen out for in this clip is often Radio Lab will write a bit of script and then cut in a bit of the interviewer, the interviewee saying, yeah. So effectively like agreeing with the script line that's just been written. So see if you can listen out for that. Um, I'm just gonna get it to the right place, sorry.
Oh, um, I should probably intro this. So this is um, from an episode of Radio Lab called Falling. And this is a story of um, she's interviewing someone about how she fell in love with her boyfriend. And so what we've heard just before this clip is she's saying that she it was when she was a student, she was on campus and she kept seeing this guy all around campus um, and that he like stared at her very intently, had like they had this like deep eye contact. And that's how we're coming into this interview. Yeah. When was the first time you talked to him? Well, we had a class together our freshman year. We talked a lot in class and after class on the paths around campus. And that's how it went all freshman year. Sophomore year. Junior year. Mm -hmm. They were sort of like particles that just kept colliding in the lobby of the dorm on the sidewalk. And each time it was new, a new topic or a new idea. For instance, one of them would walk by carrying a book, Poisonwood Bible. And the other one would say, oh, I love that book. Yeah. They just clicked. And again, eye contact. We would talk and be connected with the eyes. That's what I really was falling for about him. And there was like an attentiveness beyond. I want to ask you one thing, which like you just said, I'm falling for him. Mm -hmm. Is that the way it felt? I mean, people always say falling in love. Did it feel like falling? Yeah, it does because it feels out of control. Hmm. And there's a moment where it feels like I let go and allow myself to feel it totally. So there were some moments where she wondered if she should. Yeah. Like sometimes she'd walk by Simon on the path, look up and smile. And he'd snub me. But then we run into each other and we talk. She'd let herself start falling again. This is really fun in this moment. And I realized. Yeah, so that's just an example of how you can like really extremely cut in and out of script. So there were bits in that clip where the presenter was saying they'd both see the same book. And then you cut into the interview of just the person saying the poison were Bible and then back into the script again. And it was really fun. Yeah. So there's if you're interested in that type of scripting, I would suggest listening to Radio Lab because they are just like there are lots of other people who do it too, but they are um, famous for doing really loads and loads and loads of cutting, um, which is just like a style of making, which some people like. Um, cool. So the last clip I want to play in this section thinking about script is from another American podcast called Heavyweight. Um, which is a podcast that I really like. And I guess the interesting thing about this use of scripting is it's the presenter is like a writer and a comedian. So like a lot of the, a lot of heavyweight is really heavily scripted because the person who presents it writes the script for it and or co-writes the script for it. And, you know, his personality and the way that he talks is like a big part of the podcast. Um, but yeah, there's a, anyway, I'll play it and then and then we can talk about why. Um, but yeah, this is from an episode called Alex. Uh, I wonder how long I could do that. Uh... Gimlet Media CEO Alex Bloomberg has asked that I meet him in the studio. He's late. Hello. Oh, hey, Alex. Hi. Alex seats himself mournfully, checks his Fitbit glumly, crosses his legs with woe, and uncrosses them with even more woe. Hello, 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 hello. Can you turn me up a little teeny bit? Hello, there we go. In spite of his Gimlet Media stock options and buns of stainless steel, at the moment, Alex Bloomberg is the saddest CEO this Gimlet Media reporter has ever seen. And I am concerned because not only is Bloomberg my boss, he's also one of my oldest friends. In his hands, he holds a pile of audio cassettes, 
the old kind they had back in Shakespeare days. Yes, I had a Alicia, Margaret, one of our friends from back in the day, ceremony, French. Woman. Alex reads the labels on the cassette boxes and stacks each one on the table. I hate looking at them. I'm going to cover them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you want to uh, Why do you want me to put a this? hanky on them or something? <laughs> why? But if I hat over them. Put your hat. Uh, why is looking at these audio cassettes causing you such uh, such royals in the kishkas? Um, well, they, they represent like uh, like sort of my longest standing broken promise in my life. I think. Um, yeah, so I guess that's an example of like Jonathan Goldstein, who's the presenter of that show. Uh, he like really tees up the interview. So you then have a conversation between him and Alex, but there's lots of tape of Jonathan waiting for Alex and then script over the top of that. And then Alex arriving, listing off these tapes while Jonathan explains what's happening in the way that Renio do Lodge, um, in one of the first examples says for the benefit of the tape, this is what's happening while the interview is happening. Jonathan Goldstein has let this interview happen and then scripted over the top to explain to the listener what is going on. So that's like another way of doing it um yeah okay i'm steaming through so i'm almost that um i'm just going to do one last set of examples which is just two things um but something that i've heard recently um is so if we're thinking about scripts so if you're a, an audio producer who is not a presenter you will be working with presenters and there are some presenters who write their own scripts. There are some presenters who co-write scripts with producers. And there are some presenters who you write a script for and they read it. Um, and there are kind of like different questions around authorship with each of those things. Um, and so some people who make documentaries where the presenter is that really personally invested in the story or part of the story is their own story. Um, there are two audio producers that I think have done a really good job of instead of writing a script what they've done is they've interviewed they've they've made the documentary where the presenter has interviewed other people and they've cut that together and worked out the structure of the documentary and then they've gone back and interviewed the presenter the one who's done all the interviewing and then they've used that interview edited that into you and that's become the voiceover so instead of having a script you're just using this long interview that you've done and then dropping in the rest um, and that it's just an interesting way of doing it and it makes things sound like re very natural basically because it sounds like the presenter is just talking to you in the way that it does in like an audio montage um, so I'm just going to play two examples of like people I've heard who've done that who I thought I thought it's really worked basically um, so this first one uh, is it's from a BBC Radio 4 documentary called Unplayable um, disability in the gaming revolution, which is made by Aunt Adine. Um, and the presenter is, so the presenter is like a big, big, big gamer who's done some campaigning around like disability rights and gaming, who's called Steve. And he's got um, nystagmus, which affects his sight basically. Um, and this is from early on in the documentary where he's kind of explaining, um, yeah, his relationship to gaming and uh, his disability, I guess. Um, so we'll just listen to a bit of that and then we'll talk about what I like about it. That they would play or they'd do well, I would also would be like, oh, man, I wish I could have done that. I wish I could have been able to do that. And there would be times I would be like, well, I want to play too. And so I literally would have to get up off the couch, walk straight to the TV and have my nose almost touching the screen in order for me to be able to actually read the text that was there. I would constantly be dying or failing and getting a game over screen. The amount of the times I've seen a game over screen in my lifetime, uh, it's a lot. And so that, that always kind of stuck with you. It was like, oh, well, okay, Steve, you can't do this. And then they'll take the controller back and, and keep playing. Over time, essentially, I became a, a casual gamer at best. I was reluctant to pick up those games because I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to finish these. So what's the point in wasting my money on something that I'm probably not going to be able to play? 
it was at that point that I decided, what am I even keeping these consoles for? And to the point where in my late 20s, early 30s, I remember going to the, the store to be able to trade it in for money. And I, I remember giving them over the console and they were sort of testing it out. It was then I realized I'm probably not going to be able to play video games ever again. And that hurt. Um, it was like, it felt like I was like giving up on, on, on something that I've been doing kind of all my life. I just thought I sucked at games. There is some psychological sadness there when, you know, you just want to be able to play a game with your friends or your family and you can't. And that's really where I come into what I decided to do for a living is just to try to help people avoid that. Game accessibility really grew in two ways. The first was that um, yeah, so that is, so that whole documentary, it's, it's really interesting to listen to because the whole documentary is just um, made up of interviews. It's just interviews cut together in a way that makes narrative sense. Um, so it's a really interesting one to listen to, to think about how to not rely on a scripted voiceover. Um, so what I presume would have happened there is that they would have like done these interviews, worked out the structure of the documentary and then been like, I need a bit of tape of the presenter explaining like why he wanted more accessibility in gaming. So then the producer would have gone and been like, we need this, here are some questions to get you to tell your own personal story of this bit of like why you needed more accessibility. And then that can then segue into the people that they've interviewed talking about fighting for more accessibility in gaming, um, which I just, I just think is cool and neat um, and exciting. And then just as my last example, it's very similar. It's from a relatively new podcast series um, from Broccoli Content called We Were Always Here, um, which looks at the history of the AIDS crisis in Britain. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a very similar thing where the producer, either before or after the other interviews has done a really long interview with the, the presenter, the producer's um, Hannah Walker-Brown. Um, she's done like a big interview with, the presenter Mark Thompson um, and then the structure of the episodes go from like Mark telling his story and then it making narrative sense to drop into an interview that Mark's done with a contributor so again um, yeah it's just I just find it cool it's a, it's a cool alternative to scripts basically is what I'm trying to say um, so we'll listen to this just one last example um, as just to illustrate that um, so I'm just getting it to the right spot again. Okay. And I had an incredibly close relationship with my head of year, really close. And I told her that I was gay and I had a crush on somebody at school and it was really doing my head in. I couldn't focus. And she did a little bit of digging and she gave me some numbers for, I think it was for gay youth group, but also for switchboard, the helpline and told me if I ever needed to talk to them, the numbers were there. And so I just kept them in my in my wardrobe at home and it had like a little secret compartment behind a mirror. So I just slipped it in there and I kept my porn mags underneath the bottom drawer, the very back. So I had these two little secret cubby holes in my bedroom wardrobe. And yeah, it, they, it just stood there for ages and I never used it and that was it. And then sitting there i leave school you know and i'm about to get on with my life and i meet my first boyfriend and we start dating you know it's all very young and he's only a couple of years older than me all very lovely and romantic and he invites me out to a party one night he invites me to his friends that's it and i tell my mom we're going out to some friends she doesn't know i'm gay at this point and i go out and i stay out all night and i come back in at about six seven o'clock in the morning and go straight to my bedroom and for some reason I go and look in the cupboard and I know the paper has been moved. I'm like, oh shit. Um, uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Where am I? I'm sitting in my living room in Ghana. Um, so that I just, again, yeah, I just find that like really nice in terms of structure where 
they knew that they were going to have an interview. So that goes on to then Mark interviewing his mum about that time. So they knew they were going to have an interview with Mark talking to his mum about when he came, you know, when his mum found out that he was gay. And so what you could do if you're using a script is you could be like, when I was 16 or when I was 18 or whatever, my mum found some porn marks that had hidden in my cupboard. But because Mark's such an amazing storyteller, instead of writing a script for him, the producer has just interviewed him, asked him a question around like, could you tell me about the time that your mum discovered, you know, wh when, did, when did you come out to your mum? When did you find out? When did your mum find out that you were gay? And then he's been able to tell this story and that sits in place as the voiceover instead of a script. Um, so that's another fun way of using interviews. Uh, thank you everyone for doing so much listening. Um, I've just got some top tips now um, of what I've learned in terms of when you're doing your interviews. So I'm gonna go through them. Um, and then I've got some specific stuff around working with contributors. And then um, we've had some questions come in and I'll talk about those. And then if other people have questions, that'd be super cool too. Um, so these are just kind of like generic things that I've learned um, whilst doing lots of interviews and they're not in any way comprehensive and they're only just like tips that, you know, things that work for me and other things might work for you and that's totally chill. So take from it what you will. Um, so just to start off, yeah, when you get into an interview situation, you might be nervous um, as a producer or a presenter and also the person you're interviewing might be nervous, a little bit stiff. Um, that, so... Uh, it's a good idea not to ask the most important question of your interview first um, because you won't necessarily get the right answer. So there's there's some ways around kind of like dealing with that potential stiffness at the beginning of an interview. One of them is I usually have what I call throwaway questions. So I usually have questions, um, maybe the first one or two questions that I ask will be ones that I'm pretty sure I won't use in the final edit. Um, this is worth saying that these tips are all for like when you're doing pre-recorded interviews. Um, but yeah, I, um, yeah, cause I know I'm going to edit it. I know, I know I'm going to record for a lot longer than I'm going to, um, have in the final edit. Um, I have time to ask a question, which, you know, if I'm interviewing someone who's, so recently I interviewed someone who was an expert on moral panics who'd written a book and I knew that we weren't really going to focus this book was on kind of like queer data and I knew we weren't going to really focus on the book but the first question of the interview was like oh could you talk about the book that you've just published because it's something that the contributor is super comfortable with knows what they're going to say it gives them a little bit of time to like settle into the interview it also gives you a little bit of time to settle into the interview um and that just like gets everyone more comfortable another thing that I'll do is um, often at the end of an interview, I'll get someone, if I, so I always start interviews with saying, can you introduce yourself? Um, and I'll usually ask them to do that at the beginning and then again at the end. And often when they do it the second time, they're warmed up and they'll say something funnier, more concise, more natural. So you can also do that with your first question as well. You can you can do the whole interview and then get them to like reintroduce themselves and then ask, do you just say, I'm just gonna ask you the first question again because we're a bit more warmed up now. And that's completely fine. Um, I've written an intro to set the tone. I, so sometimes if I'm working with a presenter, I'll get the presenter to introduce themselves first. So they'll be like, hey, thanks so much for coming. I'm Jesse, and I'm really into this stuff and I really want to interview you because I'm really, I want to know more about this. Can you introduce yourself? And that's just a way of, as a, if you are a presenter, humanizing yourself to the interviewee, getting them a bit comfortable and then getting them to introduce themselves. Um, so that's some ways of getting rid of nerves and like stiffness at the beginning. Um, so I've written bullet points versus full questions. This is a total preference thing. Um, I would say one of the big aims of an interview is to, you know, know what questions you want to ask and know what you want to get from the interviewee. But in the moment, to be able to be present and actively listen to what your interviewee is saying, because sometimes, again, if you're a little bit nervous, you might... Um, be so concentrated on getting your questions one after the other that um, you forget to actually listen and pick up on what they say. Um, and so some people really need to have their questions written out in full sentences. And if that's you, that's great and fine because you know you're, you're going to be phrased properly. And some people find it easier to be a little bit more loosey-goosey and write bullet points with like, <laughs> uh, ask about time at school 
or time at school could be a bullet point. And then in the moment you can be like, what was it like when you were at school? Like who, what was your favorite teacher, blah, 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 whatever it is. Um, so there's not a right or a wrong way of doing it, but I would say maybe practice both, maybe experiment with one, experiment with another, interview your friends um, and see which one feels most natural to you. Um, open questions, it's very basic, but it's really important. So if you want, you want to be getting your interviewee talking, you want to hear what they have to say. So instead of asking like, was it hard? Where they could answer you yes or no, you could say, could you tell me what that was like? Or you could say that's like, that sounds hard. Or so just think about phrasing your questions in a way that's going to elicit a response that isn't just a yes or a no answer, basically. In a similar way, um, you can just say to someone, can you tell me a story about or could you give me an anecdote about? Um, this is a bit of advice that my friend, Ali Adlington, who's also a radio producer, told me. And it's so it's just really true because everyone has little stories and examples of things in their brains. Um, so if you want to know um yeah so like uh, the podcast that we just listened to mark who's talking about like being gay in the 80s if you want to know if you want to like paint a picture of like that time that social time you could just be like can you tell me a story that illustrates like what your life was like when you were 16 or like what your queer life was like when you were 16 could you give me like an anecdote about what clubs were like at the time in london and nine times out of ten someone just will have a story and then um, that's a really like that's a really useful thing to have someone telling a story of a specific thing that will il illustrate a wider point. Um, if they say, "Oh, I just can't think of one," that's fine. You can move on. You can also ask them again later when they're more warmed up. Um, so yeah, I would recommend doing that. Um, yeah, facts versus feelings. It, so what I mean by this is, it's good before your interview to know what are the key facts that you need from your interviewee? What are the like factual things that you need them to say? Is it like um, when things were happening? Who was there? Um, are you getting historical information out of them? Are you getting information on, you know, are they an expert on lizards and you need to know very specific things about lizards? Those are all the facts that you need to think that you, you need to work out what, that you need. Um, but I think like bringing stuff to life is often when you do more kind of like feelings based questions. Um, in the example, like with Hillary Clinton, how can you, uh, what questions can you think of that are going to get them out of the kind of like stuff that they're used to saying, rehearse things that they're used to saying, which could be really cool and really informational, but might sound to a listener slightly more boring. How can you break their kind of like, you know, how can you make it sound spontaneous? How can you get them? chatting about things and often that is by asking about feelings <laughs> so like if with the lizard example you can maybe you're talking about like the yellow spotted lizard and you need to know what country it's from all of those things and they've answered all of those things and then you can say like you know could you tell me an anecdote about you know when did, when did you first see one and how did it feel or like do you do you give them more names or like what's who's your favorite you know you could just ask things that they're getting to get them to speak personally from their own experience and just give a bit of like color and texture and life to the subject that you're talking about um and i like to think about that in terms of like fact and feeling questions i hope that that makes sense um in a similar way it's nice to help you know we're doing audio we need we're, we're doing even more work making audio work because there aren't any visuals to back up the stuff that we're hearing um so it's good to think about ways that you can write your questions or phrase your questions that are going to get your interviewee to paint a really full picture to like build like the yeah to build a scene to bit like to build the picture of what you're what you're talking about a really easy way is get is asking about specific senses so as an example i did an interview recently with someone who was at the green and common peace camp which was like an anti-nuclear camp um, in their 80s uh, in England and we wrote one of the questions we wrote was like when you first got to Greenham could you just tell us like what did it like what did it smell like who was there what could you see what did you sit on like we just thought about all of the senses and then we asked her all of them 
and she was amazing she told us this amazing story of walking in and there being like really strong wood smoke and then she sat on a log next to someone like cutting up vegetables for dinner and like and so then it, it, it that like facilitated her kind of like building up this like, picture for us in our minds which is really useful um another technique is if you're getting someone to tell a story about something that's happened to them or like something that happened in the past um it's sometimes nice to get them to speak in the present tense or to somehow get them situate them back in the moment that it happened to them so if, so you feel the immediacy of the thing happening in the in the tape one way of doing that is sometimes you can get them to like close their eyes and be like can you tell me like can you picture being there and then to talk about it as if it's happening now like in the present tense um another way is instead of saying like so when did it all start or could you tell me about when you first when that happened to you if you know the beginning of the story so say they were like involved in say they met their partner on the tube because i've got this tube example here you could say um can you tell me about when you first met your partner and that could really work but if you want to get them doing kind of sounding more like they're telling a story you could start the story off for them so you could be like so it's tuesday april 1979 you're sitting on the tube what's going on and because you've kind of set the tone of that method of speaking sometimes they will then continue that way of storytelling and you get that kind of like immediacy story 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 instead of like them kind of like remembering um again really simple but in, in the same way as the senses one thinking about asking questions for each sense asking who what when where where how who what when where how um is just like is just good and useful in terms of like making sure you've got all of the information and one of those questions one of those ways of asking a question might get someone talking so it's if you if you're like have I asked questions for all of the information that I need it's really good to check yourself have you asked about who was there what happened when it happened where it was and how it went or how it felt or whatever um this really takes practice this next suggestion but it is just okay to ask people to repeat themselves. It's just fine. Um, and it really takes confidence to do that because sometimes you feel like you, you know, someone's answered a question and then you just have to move on. Um, and everyone has different techniques. Mine is just being like, so if someone says something, if someone's answered my question, but I need them to explain something more, I usually, I'm just quite honest and I'll just be like, oh, that was so interesting. I, I really like what you said about this. Um, I didn't I just didn't quite understand it would you mind explaining it in a different way or would you mind explaining it again um or you can just say oh thank you so much do you mind if I, I'm just going to ask you that question again um just to get a slightly different way of you answering it for the edit so I, I tend to be like relatively transparent about why I'm asking about a question again obviously I would never say you didn't answer that right <laughs> I would more be like I'd just love to have like a little bit more for the like so in the edit I've got more options or whatever different ways of you answering it or like um I would love to have a little bit more so it, so I just I'm finding it a bit difficult to understand do you mind just saying that again or do you mind just expanding on that a little bit um and I I mean I can't speak for anyone else I have never had a time where I've asked someone to repeat themselves or explain something more and they've been annoyed about it I think it's something that sometimes people are a bit like um worried about doing but I think if you if you need it, ask for it, and usually it's fine. And the worst that's going to happen is they're if they're in a bad mood or something, and they're like, "I just answered that." You can then just move on, and that is okay. And you can work out later how to fill in the gap of that information in the edit in the script, like the kind of examples that we've spoken about. Um, this next point: be prepared, then listen. Is we've kind of spoken about it, but it's this idea that it's really good to know what you want to get from your interviewee. Um, it's really good to have planned your questions, to have done your research, to know what what, what you're doing going into the interview. Um, but there's always a danger of like sticking too close to the plan and missing something that your interviewee says, which is really interesting, which is off kind of your script, if you will. Um, so, yeah, like, yeah. Um, again, if you're making pre-recorded stuff, which is what I do, you have loads of time. like you're gonna edit afterwards. So um, it's okay 
for you to like just listen to the response that you're being given by the interviewee if they say something interesting ask about that even if it's not your next question and then either you'll learn to naturally move on to your next question when you feel like it's appropriate or if you feel like you've got a bit distracted um and I've, and you've like waffled you've both waffled on and it's gone off like the plan of the interview or like it's no longer relevant to what you want to ask them about if you're editing like i am afterwards you can also say I'm so sorry, we've got a little bit off topic. I'm just going to check my question list and then I'm going to bring us back to the next question. And again, like that's just okay to be honest about that. You can cut that out later. It's not going to go into the final bit, but it's okay to like signal to and to why things are happening and when. Um, and just be like, I'm just going to check my questions and then we're just going to get back on track. And like, that's just kind of fine. Um, one of my favorite things that I like to do, I, the, I've, this is, I don't really mean awkward silence, but it is, um, what I mean by awkward silence is there is a natural human impulse to fill silence. Um, and so often that means if your interviewee has finished answering a question, there's an impulse to stop awkwardness happening by immediately asking another question. Um, and what I would suggest practicing is not doing that. Um, and that's because quite often if you've asked your interviewee a question and they answer it, they finish answering and you just sit back and wait for a little bit and give them a little bit of time to process what they've just said. They will often continue talking. They will often like qualify what they've said, say it in a slightly different way, expand on it, have a moment where they think they're like, oh yeah, and that also really reminds me of, and then they might tell you another story. Um, if you just give a little bit of breathing space to the interview, often you get really nice and unexpected stuff from your interviewee because they will then fill the silence rather than you. So I guess what I'm saying is like, there's no rush. It's okay to like give space, pause, wait, and you might get some really nice stuff from the interviewee when you do that. Um, sometimes this is appropriate and sometimes it's not, but I generally are on the side of like telling the interview how I, interviewee how I feel about what they're saying. So I also might, if they say something to me, I might be like, whoa, I don't know how I would have dealt with that. Or I might be like, oh, I think I would have been so embarrassed if that happened to me or, oh, that sounds really hard or, oh my God, that sounds so exciting. So those aren't kind of questions. Those are more, I guess, like me just sharing how I feel about what they said, but often that, you know, an interview is a conversation and often that elicits a response from the interviewee and then they like talk about that. Um, and that's just like another way of keeping the flow going and getting them to do more chatting about stuff. Um, so this last bit is, this last point is, those are the points work for audio montages and for if you're the presenter, like those are just kind of like generalized into top tips. Um, the two things I'll say about if you're thinking about doing an audio montage, which is when you are interviewing someone with the intention of your voice not being in it at all. One of them I mentioned earlier is you brief your interviewee to say the question that you ask them in their answer. So where are you from? I am from London, not just London. Um, the other one is if you're, you need to think about the fact that you don't want the intonation of the interviewee, the, like the way that they say, say responses to sound like they're answering a question. Because often when someone first answers the question, they'll be like, oh, uh, well, I guess I started like this and then la 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 la. And if you hear that, it, you know that they've been asked a question, it sounds like they've been asked a question. Um, so sometimes if you're doing an audio montage, I generally write statements or um, the only word that's come to me is like commands, which sounds really extreme, but like um, I, I usually are, rephrase my questions to not be questions. So instead of saying, um, how did it feel to go to the Met Gala? which I might do if I was a presenter asking a question, I would change it to tell me about the Met Gala. Tell me about when you went to the Met Gala. So instead, and that just means that it's less likely because I've not asked them a question. I've said, please tell me about. It's less likely that the beginning of their answer will sound like they're answering a question, if that makes sense. Um, I just have one more slide and then I'm here for questions from everyone. Um, so this is, we had a question around like working with interviewees who have like 
um, particular needs or who have like particular traumatic stories to tell. Um, one thing that I will say to that is like, it's, it's very good to think about why you are doing that interview and like whether the contributor you're working with wants to do it. <laughs> um, Cause no one has, if someone's gone through something, no one has to talk, they don't have to talk about it if they don't want to. So I think like before going into any interview, it's worth being like, why am I doing this interview? Why has the person agreed to do it? Is it worth, you know, is it worth doing? Does everyone involved feel good about it? Um, and part of the way that you can make sure they do is like really prepping your interviewee and making sure that they are completely aware of like the parameters of the interview you're going to do. So if you're working with someone, so if I'm interviewing like a politician, a professional, someone who I'm trying to hold to account, I would treat it differently. But if I'm interviewing someone who hasn't necessarily been interviewed for radio before, who has a particular personal story to tell, any of those things, these are some of the ways that I would like prep the interviewee. The first one is if you have time, do a pre-interview, which is an unrecorded, usually phone call, or if you have time, go and meet them, where you chat to them, hear some of their story, like ask them some of the questions that you're going to ask in the recording, um, which is a chance for you to get to know them and for them to get to know the way that you ask questions. And for, to feel out between you, like what questions they're willing to answer and what they're not. Um, and you can be really transparent about that. So you're like working out what bits of their story they might want to tell. And then you can go away and frame your questions around getting out those bits of the story that they want to tell. Um, often I'm asked by people I'm going to interview to send a list of the questions in advance. And I totally understand why people ask that because it's scary to go into an interview and not know what you're going to be asked. I usually, um, refuse to send the actual questions and the reason for and that's i'm absolutely always open to discussing that depending on the needs of the contributor but usually i'll push back and say i don't want to send the exact questions because you can really hear on audio if someone has rehearsed answers and that really takes the listener out of the experience but what i will always do is i'll say these are the kinds of things we're going to be asking you so we're going to want to focus on we're going to be asking you questions about your life between the ages of 16 and 18. We're going to be reflecting on um, what it's like to move country as a young person. And we're going to be um, ending by talking about like the political context of the country you moved to at the time or whatever it is. So if you know the vague things you're going to be looking at, I would always tell them to interview you so that they know and can do a bit of preparing without literally rehearsing and scripting answers. Um, I would always brief the interviewee on the target audience of your show. So for example, at the moment, I'm making a six part series about like history that young people don't necessarily learn at school. And so the target audience is 16 to 24 year olds. And so I'll brief the interviewees by being like, um, this is for 16 to 24 year olds, like, um, please, if you use technical language that you wouldn't have learned at school, can you explain what the technical language is, etc. Or I used to make um, the Serpentine podcast for Serpentine Galleries and their target audience was like average people who don't go to art galleries kind of thing. And so when I used to interview contributors for the Serpentine podcast, I used to be like, so my mum, she's 67 years old. She's never been to a gallery apart from the Tate Modern, which she took me to when I was a kid can you answer in a way that would include her, would allow her to understand? She's like, she didn't go to uni, blah, 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 all of those things. So um, it's worth like pitching to your contributor, the kind of person who's gonna be listening and like what you want the listener to get out of it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, really often in pre-recorded recordings. So I think we've had a question about this too. I can't actually see the chat right now, but um, I'll answer it after, but um, I usually interview, so I'm making half an hour documentaries at the moment. I'm interviewing contributors who will probably be in the documentaries for about like seven to 10 minutes. And those interviews are usually an hour long. Um, different audio producers will have different amounts of time and it's like really just like a learning process, but generally I'll interview someone for about an hour and then edit it down to like between seven and 10, six to 10 minutes maybe. And it's really important to tell the, the interviewee that you're gonna do that because you're going to talk about a lot of stuff in an hour, which is not going to make it into the final edit. So I will say that I'll be like, we're going to talk for an hour. I'll probably be editing it into like this much. 
these are the kinds of ways in which I will do that editing. Um, as I mentioned before, because it's pre-recorded, you can take breaks and you can tell your contributor to that too. So I would leave, if you're going to do an hour worth recording, I would leave like, you know, an hour afterwards so you can be flexible in your own time. And then you can say to them, like, if it gets a bit heavy, if you need a glass of water, if you need to cough, if you get halfway through a sentence and you decide that you don't like the way you're saying it and you want to say it in a different way, there's loads of time and space for that. So you just tell them that they've got time and space, you're editing it afterwards to make them sound good. If they need to like go off for five minutes and come back, it's like giving them the space to do that will like make them comfortable and like make them feel held basically. Um, I usually like to, again, this is completely subjective. Different people do different things. I don't like to, you know, as an audio producer who's doing the edit, you have so much power um, and authorship over how the person finally sounds. And it's really important to think about that power and like how to approach your position in storytelling in that way. Um, and one of the things that I like to do with some contributors, again, I would not do this with a politician, um, but with someone who's like not been interviewed before or sharing a very personal story, I'll say to them during the recording, like while I'm interviewing you, if you say something and then you decide that you don't want it included, you can say on the recording, please don't include what I just said. And that's fine and I won't. And I also like to, I will say to my contributors, if you want, I will send you the full tape after we've finished recording it and you can have a listen through generally because of literally time constraints like on this project I'm working on now in the contributor release form it says you have 24 hours to listen through to the interview we've just done and come back to me and say these are the bits I'm not comfortable with and then after that point I'll be like now thank you for telling me I'm going to do the edit now and like and it's kind of now you passed it to me and I'm going to do um, I have authorship now over this um yeah that's something that I like to do obviously if they like have a full job for the next 12 hours like I, I can be flexible over like if it doesn't have to be just in 24 hours but we, we basically make that agreement between each other and then they get to like listen through not in the actual like moment of being interviewed and then if they're like oh that's like a revealing detail that I don't want or that's a Thing that actually I don't know if I want people to hear it gives them that time after being interviewed to like let me know um yeah and then like it's more boring briefing but it's really good to do so again with the audio montages getting them to say can you put your question my question in your answer if you use technical language um please explain it um and then if as a producer, because we're all making stuff on Zoom now, it's also things like being like, can you hear a washing machine in your background? Like, have you are you wearing headphones? All of those things. Um, what I say is you can brief your interview as much as possible, but while they're doing the interview, they're just going to be concentrating on being asked questions and answering them. So as a producer or as a presenter, it's your job to remind them of things. So they might forget to put your question in their answer. If they do something like that in audio montage making, usually I won't interrupt them, I'll let them get to the finish of what they're saying and then be like, that was so amazing, thanks so much for that response. Like, you just forgot to, um, it's just the beginning of that sounded like you're answering a question, would you mind just restarting telling the story and just get them to tell the beginning of the story again? And then you could be like, great, I've got the rest, I can make that edit kind of thing. Um, cool, I'm gonna leave up this, um, slide which just says all of the um programs that i've played like podcasts and radio shows that i've played and it's got my um i really like chatting to people about radio so it's got my like contact details you can get my email from my website and then that's my like social media so if you have questions like after this zoom um get in touch i'm like around and i like chatting to people who make audio um but yeah i guess now there's time for some questions if anyone um if anyone has them you can put them in the chat i'm just going to go through the ones that we've already had um yeah so the first one i think i kind of talked about this but yeah it was how do you deal with interviewing people who've experienced personal tragedy tragedy i always feel like i'm prying and shouldn't be bringing up pain um yeah i think that for me that's a conversation to be had 
before the record is on. Um, so as I said, like, it, is your contributor up for doing the interview? Are they aware of like where the story of personal tragedy is going? Who's going to listen to it? Like all of those things, have they consented? And if they have and they want to do it, um, for me, it'd be totally fine to say to them, like, we're going to be covering some really like difficult, traumatic stuff in this interview. Let me know if you need a break. Um, just so you know, you don't have to answer any of my questions. If it feels too much, you can just say, I don't want to answer that. And you can also say to them, like, how do you like being asked about this stuff? Like, is there a way of talking about this stuff that's most comfortable for you? Um, so I think, yeah, basically having that chat before the microphone's on and getting to know each other and like working out how you're both going to do this interview together is a way of dealing with um, that kind of like deep stuff. Um, the next person has said, what do you do if a person thinks they've answered a question, but they haven't? Um, I think I kind of said this a bit earlier, but yeah, I sometimes tend to like slightly blame myself in those situations. So I tend to do something like, that was so amazing. I just, I didn't quite understand this bit. So I'll kind of make it that I didn't understand rather than that they answered it wrong. Um, and then just ask them to repeat themselves. And as I said, just like, if you can try and practice getting more comfortable with asking them to, people to repeat themselves, um, usually they just are okay to do that. Um, and then we've got how long are the interviews that you do in relation to the length of the piece, how much of it are you going to use, etc. So I kind of said that, like, I roughly will do an hour long interview. An hour long interview will give me anything from like, if I, if it's for a documentary, it will probably be for a six to 10 minute segment. If it's for an audio montage and I'm making like a 15 minute piece, I'll probably interview for like an hour, an hour and a half. Um, I don't know if I, I think I maybe do quite like long interviews. I think I honestly, basically it's kind I know it's like annoying, but it's like, it is a slightly, um, it's kind of subjective to you and your kind of workout. Um, all I'd suggest is like making a bunch of stuff, doing a bunch of interviews and working out how much of the interview you actually end up using. And that will get you, um, more used to it, I guess. Um, one caveat, I guess, is sometimes you just don't have time. The contributor has to be up for being there for an hour and a half. You can do an hour and a half interview. So you just need to ask them about that. Um, and if you've got someone like we interviewed one of the interviews, one of the docs I'm making at the moment is about like Scottish politics and we interviewed him like a Scottish MSP and she only had half an hour for us. So we had to like, we didn't have the space to ask throwaway questions at the beginning. We were just like, we need to get on, go. We've got our five questions that we need answered. So it's partly about, you know, working within the parameters of your contributor as well. Um, and then I'm going to say now that this is the last question in the chat. So if anyone has other questions, please post them in um, while I'm answering this one. Um, but this one is, how do you plan your interviews? Are there different ways for different kinds of interviews? Um, yes, so I guess I plan my interviews by doing a bunch of research. So generally I would have done research to work out who the best person to interview is. And then once I've found the person, I'll make sure before approaching them that I know like who they are, what their vibe is, what I'm gonna want to ask them. Then I'll approach them and say like, hey, I want to you for like this documentary, it would be covering this kind of stuff. Here's a description of the rest of the documentary. Can we have a chat? And then I would have a pre-interview phone call with them for like 10, 15 minutes where I explain a bit more about the documentary. And then I'm like, is this the kind of thing that you want to talk about? We'd be really interested to ask you about like X. Do you mind just like telling me a bit about what you might say? And that just lets, gives, because I'm a producer and I often work with presenters, it means that I can take notes and it helps me and the presenter then write the questions because we know the kind of like way that they would respond. Um, so that's how I do planning. And then I would either on my own, if I'm not working with a presenter or with a presenter, write um, questions for the interview. I usually am like, I usually have a rough beginning, middle and end. So I'll be like, I kind of want to start covering this stuff in the middle the real crux of what we probably will need will be like these questions and then at the end like it'd be nice to get them reflecting on this stuff like i'll probably leave my like more reflective questions for the end because again the interview will be more like warmed up by the end um so i'll do like a rough arc of the interview and then fill in the questions 
before that, like within that. Um, and then in terms of like different ways for different kinds of interviews, I guess like if you're working with a presenter, <clears throat> you're also thinking about how the presenter is going to sound when they ask the questions. Whereas in if I'm making an audio montage, I know that I need all of the information from this one interview. Um, and I don't have the privilege of afterwards scripting in and out any, any information that we left. So I'll also probably write down like what are all the things that I need. I'll probably write down like everything I need and then make that into questions. And then while I'm doing the interview, literally like check off. Um, and again, <laughs> I, I like feel no shame at the end of an interview saying, I'm really sorry, I just really need this one thing which we didn't manage to get. Do you mind um, just telling me about this? Um, so I'm like, I guess like a bit transparent about being like, I just really need this stuff for it to work. Um, yeah, that's the end of the questions that we've got so far. I'm happy to do any more chatting if anyone has, has any other um, questions or thoughts or feelings. Um, but if they don't, then <laughs> um, it was nice to do some, it's kind of funny because I don't know who's here, but it was nice to do like loads of chatting at whoever was here. Um, and thank you for coming and spending your Tuesday evening listening to me. Um, and as I say, I've put my kind of like contact details on this last slide. So if anyone um, has other questions or wants to ask about making audio or has a, like wants advice on like getting into audio stuff um i'm always up for having those kind of chats so um yeah get in touch if that's you um yeah and thank you <laughs>